how do the quiet quitters think it's going to work out for them? Let's say uh, you make the decision to quit quietly. What's the end game? I want to introduce a new term, quiet grinding. This is the antithesis to quiet quitting. Generally, it comes out in the people who should notice, do notice. Like people are happy when you've completed the project that, that you said you were going to complete. There are two things that everybody needs to know about their employee. One, can you be trusted? The second is discipline. Are you disciplined enough to see the thing through? It's something that I've run into a lot. A lot of people will talk about all of the projects they're gonna do and all the ideas that they have, and then they do exactly none of them. It is a trap and it needs to be recognized, it needs to be called out. Hey, welcome to the Create Unknown, the home of Make Something Mean Something. I am Kevin Lieber. It is TCU's day. We are here every Tuesday, 6 p.m. Eastern live on Discord. If you want to chat with us, become a patron. If you want to just lurk, you can do that too. With me, as always, is Matthew Tabor. Yeah, and this time, now that you're back, I am fully and properly on the main gear vibe setup. This thing is amazing. I was talking before we started recording about the adjustments from being Mac heavy for like seven or eight years and going back to to uh, the PC life. Um, it's been it's been pretty good, uh, other than the odd missed keystroke uh but but this thing flies the people who are in the discord now uh are seeing the led display uh but it's it's incredible like i've never had a computer where everything happened instantly it, it's like watching it's like being part of a sci-fi show where it's like doo -doo 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 -doo, and then the thing just instantly pops on the screen well everything i do i put forward uh to this machine just happens in front of me almost to the point where it's jarring. Like I expect delays on of a few seconds on every little thing I do. Uh, and I just don't have any delays. So it's amazing. Uh, the setup is coming along properly, which is great. Uh, and yeah, we've got the link in the description uh, for you to check out main gear stuff. The one that I've got is from the vibe line, but they have several different lines at several different price points. Uh, if you use the code create, which is also in the description, uh, you'll get, you'll get an extended warranty, uh, but it was, it, it was amazing to set up. It looks awesome. Uh, I've, I've never really been excited for a computer before, but I, I legitimately am now. So Kevin, now you're back. You can bask in its glory. I am basking in its glory. Now that I'm looking at it for the first time, actually, and seeing the light show that's going on, it <laughs> reminds me of the the scene from Blade. I don't know if anybody has watched Blade recently. You should, because that movie is completely awesome. But there's like that very kind of iconic scene in Blade in that dance club where there's just a whole lot of sl oh, slaughtering yeah. going on. And it's a yeah. great, great, memorable scene. So I imagine like a, a little Blade inside your... Main Gear PC just chopping up vampires. And uh, I, 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 I did like tone that. it down, though. I toned it down because it, it comes with a little remote and you can set any color on the lights. And I thought, well, you, you know, we do pink and purple around here. So I just popped it on pink uh, and it's just, you know, another click to purple. But before I had it on the, the full array that just changes colors and moves and, and all of that stuff. But, you know, if you want to settle it down for some reason, whether it's too bright or too busy, uh, you just push the button and do that. So yeah, I I'm loving getting to know <laughs> the, the awesome features on this. Yeah. It's definitely very, very advanced and high tech. Well, before we get into today's topic, uh, I want to give a quick rundown of our upcoming guests because we are booked solid for the next month with awesome, awesome guests. Uh, next week, we will be joined by my good friend Jabril. Uh, the week after that, Niall Red will enter the Create Unknown. And then uh, Bobby Duke, who we were going to have tonight, but he had uh, something come up. So we've rescheduled Bobby Duke for um, mid-October. And then we're rounding out October with a very spooky Halloween episode <laughs> where we'll be joined by someone who's not spooky at all, but one of the uh, the funniest people that have, has ever graced YouTube, Mr. Ian Hecox from Smosh, one of the true 
legends and OGs of YouTube. What's funny is the amount of people who probably listen to this podcast who grew up watching Smosh when they were <laughs> little kids. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now they're looking to have a career on YouTube or, or do have careers on YouTube after being inspired by the shenanigans and the food fights and everything that Ian got up to back then and continues to do a lot of different uh, diverse offerings and um, kind of executive production sort of stuff. We'll, we'll get into that when he joins us on October 25th. But Matt and I have a little something that we need to discuss, a little no guest topic episode on something that kind of annoyed me a few weeks back, maybe a month ago at this point. I was trending a little bit. This uh, this article came out about this concept that really rubbed me personally the wrong way. I think it kind of goes against a lot of what we try to discuss, encourage, and inspire on this podcast and really the, the crux, the motto of the podcast, which is make something mean something. Mm -hmm. And that is this concept of quiet quitting, quiet quitting, which... Uh, Matt, I don't know how much you know about quiet quitting. If if anybody hasn't heard about this term, could you fill them in on what that entails? Yeah. So when you said you wanted to talk about quiet quitting, I was I was happy about that because I've seen a fair bit about it. You know, people talking on on Twitter, but they didn't really go into the reasons uh, for why you do it or how it actually works. I know enough to put on a bumper sticker, and that's that's really about it. So so what does quiet quitting entail? Well, it, it essentially um, suggests to do the bare minimum that will get you by at your job, not to go above and beyond to basically just eke out, you know, whatever little amount of responsibility and work that you can in order to sort of um, not be so overwhelmed with work or not feel so much pressure or stress over work and I don't know if any of this has to do with remote work and, um, you know, not being in an office anymore, but it seemed like the general vibe was this tenant that, you know, work is not important. Your job uh, is taking advantage of you and your time and your energy. So stop giving it so much of those things and you'll be a happier person. Okay. So a... I want to be clear on the reasons people are even thinking about quiet quitting. Um, it can be anything from, <clears throat> from what I'm, I'm hearing from you, uh, wanting to quit that job, but not being able to, like, you got to keep your job, but you hate your job. So you, you scale it back or, uh, reserving as much of your energy and talent and sanity as possible and giving as little of that as possible to your job. Is that, is that the spectrum that we're looking at? Right, right. You only do okay. essentially the bare minimum. You only work like the exact work hours that you're required to work. You only do the okay. exact things that you're required to do in order to keep your job. It's not actually about quitting. You're not quiet. Quitting is not quitting your job. It is just the opposite of going above and beyond. It's not, you know, staying late and finishing things after you're supposed to be there, you know, if you're if you're done with work at 5 p.m., you know, you're clocking out at, uh, you know, 4, 59, 59 <laughs> and you're leaving yeah. and you're not thinking about work until you clock back in at 9 a.m. Uh, yeah. And last week when I, I dropped this in at the end of the conversation with Ben, I, I, I brought up the example of working to contract that uh, that teachers have done in a, a sort of shot across the bow before. Uh, any strike action happens. It, it's sort of the first message that a teacher's union would send to a school is that we're going to work only to the contract. And if the contract says that we have to be in the classroom at 8 a.m. and uh, no later than 3.15, then those are exactly you know, the times that we'll be in and out. We're not going to do any duties that aren't expressly specified in the contract. And it's all the stuff that that people, you know, it, that that takes out the stuff that people expect an employee to do, even though uh, it's not officially in the rules. You now you work uh, late if there's stuff to be done, or you show up early if you have to, or in the case of a teacher, it's things like writing college recommendations, which they don't get paid for. But if a student asks them, uh, you know, you, you kind of 
have to do that. <laughs> that's that's part of the job, even though it isn't. Uh, and they'll scale it back to working the contract. So as I was seeing all of this stuff on Twitter, it had that same vibe that we're going to do the bare minimum. And I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell the degree to which people were willing to put themselves in or in a vulnerable position where it's like, we're going to do the bare minimum that keeps us from getting fired, or we're going to do the bare minimum to keep us from potentially being fired, you know, to keep me like in the 50th percentile. I, I don't know. So I lost a little bit of interest in following the minutiae, but uh, the more people talked about it, the more I started to think about when it is a really bad idea and, and when it might be appropriate too. Oh, well, then I'm really excited to hear what you think about when it should be appropriate. I'll, I'll tell you what it made me think of, and, and I'll actually bring it back to school as well, because okay. I had a teacher, an English teacher once who was like the epitome of quiet quitting, and he was the laughing stock of the school. Um, his class was a total joke. I learned nothing in that class. It was useless. And this guy, he wasn't going to get fired. He had tenure, like whatever. There was no way anyone was going to get rid of him. He wasn't doing anything like on paper that was visibly harmful. He just was so unbelievably lazy and did so little that uh, I think that it was tangentially harmful for wasting an entire year. Um, of like my formative education years uh, and I'll, and I'll be specific. Yeah. So this is what his class was like, uh, there, you know, there's five days in a week and each day was either a reading day or a writing day. And that was it. There was no, he never taught us anything. There was never a, a lecture day or a teaching day or a project day. It, literally you would go in the class, you would sit down you know, if it was Monday, it was like a reading day and he would whip out oh, yeah. a book and he would read his book and he expected the rest of the class to whip out whatever <laughs> book they were reading yeah. and they would sit there and read nice. books. But guess what the kids didn't do? Read, read the books. Everybody just talked. Everybody just BSed and, and goofed off and did nothing. And then the same thing with the writing day. Okay. Now today's a writing day. And once again, he would just sit at his desk and read whatever book he was reading. And then everybody was just expected to sit there and write um, about whatever. There was like no guidance whatsoever. And the same thing occurred. Shockingly, none of the students actually wrote anything until, you know, the night before the thing was due. You just essentially crap something out that was not good. And then he would give you little to no feedback on and just scribble a grade on it. Oh, wow. Okay. Great job. You know, 83 or whatever, just make something up. <laughs> this, this was quiet quitting to me was this, this teacher who just did just the bare minimum. I don't even know how else to describe it. Cause it seems like it should come up with an even more exaggerated term for it, but it was just such a useless class. It wasted everyone's time. It wasted a full year yeah. when we could have been learning I don't know how to read and write better, uh, which all sorts of things, which people yeah. could definitely use. It's you talk about how it's the most yeah. um, useful skill. Those are the most useful skills you could possibly learn is how to read and how to write. And um, we cheated out of it. And he had no interest in doing anything other than the bare minimum. And it sucked. It really sucked. Even if at the time. Us kids were like, oh, cool. You know, we have this class where we could just goof off. It's like, okay. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, it was useless and I think detrimental. And it's it, it was just a terrible way. And this dude did this for how many years? A lot of years. To how the many more students? You talk, the more I... Oh, thousands. Yeah. Thousands. Yeah. yeah. The more you talk, the more I, I, you know, figured out who it was. Here's the really crazy thing. As Kevin was talking, I had to do like narrow it down. It was it's like 20 questions where it would get closer and closer. And I, uh, English re really narrowed it down, but I thought, well, maybe that was just like, you know, a general euphemism, you know, so somebody can't be identified or something like that. But they, the point is that there were several possibilities in my mind. That's how many people were quiet quitting uh, back in the day and, and pulling a, a pretty reasonable salary and dealing with like many, many we, hundreds we had of a thousands teacher who of dollars would just leave. per pupil expenditure. He would just leave. Yes. Literally had a teacher yeah, who, I don't even know where he went. He would just leave. Is, 
Is this the one who put all the textbooks in the center of the room at the front and then left? Yes. Because I, yeah. Yeah. So, and that was when, when you completed a unit, you would go to his desk and ask to be given the test for that unit. He'd give you the worksheet out of the book and you would go and do it. You did this whenever you wanted to. And all that mattered was that you completed X number of units by the end of the the 10 weeks. Um, it, believe it or not, the last week was a hell of a scramble for like 110% of kids in the class. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that's that's quiet quitting in action. And I'm sure I'm glad that you used the school example because um, I'm sure everybody listening can think of somebody that they had in school who really was just a, a warm body in that room and didn't do a whole lot else. Yeah, absolutely. And there was no accountability um, for them. So that's what they did. You know, they didn't do anything above the bare minimum. They wouldn't get fired. Some of them got paid really well to do that. That guy who left yes. class was one of the highest paid teachers in that school. And he yep. would not even be present. He literally wouldn't even be present. He wouldn't even be the warm body. The body was cold. It was empty. Yeah. <laughs> it was a drafty, <laughs> empty room, <laughs> classroom. It was too far away was, for the uh, the meter to read. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was gone. I don't know where he was. So that that's uh, like on this on the side of what I personally think of, of quiet quitting, that's what comes to mind is someone with just no sense of responsibility or integrity or taking pride in what they do. It's just, you know, I don't really care about this. But, I just want my paycheck and I want to go but, home and that's it. But there's that, that example that I threw out about here's a group of people doing this, this work to contract this quiet quitting as a group because they feel like. Uh, they're being mistreated in some way or there's some grievance uh, by the union. So uh, there's a purposeful one as opposed to just I am I want to be as completely useless and lazy as possible so that I can focus on playing you know, Clash of Clans on my phone. Um, I, so I do think there's a, a reason that uh, that somebody can do the quiet quitting angle in a way with purpose, if that if that makes sense. Okay, so so the purpose is to make a statement about uh, like worker treatment in the in, in that the, in case, that, in that the narrow narrow case. Yeah, but that I, I didn't see anything like that on Twitter. I mean, when people were talking about quiet quitting and how they wanted to do it, or they've done it, or they'd been doing it before it had a name, uh, I, I didn't see anybody say, "Well, this is my manner of, of protest because X, Y, and Z need to be changed." I didn't see any of that. Maybe you did, but I didn't. Uh, no, not at all. And I would think that in your instance, if there are serious grievances, then there are probably more vocal ways to address those rather than just hiding in a corner and not doing anything, yeah. you know, which is what I think quiet quitting is. That that seems to be almost like a pretty bad strategy Unless you just feel that the situation is hopeless, which is definitely possible. If you feel like the situation is hopeless and, and your voice will never be heard, then all that's left to do really is the bare minimum. So like under those circumstances and you're not being respected and you never will be, then I could see doing that. Um, and it's it, it's really easy for other people to say, well, why don't you just get a different job? Well, that that can be hard. That mm -hmm. takes, takes risk. Yeah. A lot of time. Yeah, yeah, and can be scary. So if you're getting paid well enough to <laughs> to basically George Costanza, if if anybody's a Seinfeld fan, it seems seems like George Costanza is like the archetype almost of quiet quitting, yeah. like episodes where he was like literally napping under his desk and determining like the best way to to take a nap while at work and things like that, um, <laughs> right. or just pretending yeah. to work at a place that he didn't at all. Um, but that happened. Yeah. Uh, to, to, but I, 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 what I want to say about this topic and, and the point really of doing a podcast about it is that I think that doing, doing the opposite of this can be really beneficial to you, uh, perhaps in ways that you don't question, realize. Can I ask a question before you go into what you really should do? Yes. Um, how do the quiet quitters think it's going to work out for them. I mean, like, what do they see happening? Let's say you make the decision to quit quietly and you go along this path. What's the end game? Did you, did you see any consensus about what they hope to happen? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, the end game is just to not have work dominate your life. 
the the end game okay. is to you know have just more feel better. Yeah, yeah. Um, have okay. more free time to yourself with your friends and your family. Um, not let work be this uh, domineering thing when you're not being probably justly rewarded for that. I think that's like ultimately the idea there is just to leave work okay. at work and then have your own life and um, separate the two, not have them bleed into one another. And that that would create uh, a healthier approach to a work-life balance. Okay. And yeah, sorry to interrupt on that. I just, I thought, you know, let's, let's be clear about uh, what, what the stakes are, because if there's an alternative that's better, it has to be a better end game and a better outcome than whatever quiet quitting is. Uh, So yeah, now I, now I understand that better. Yeah. And I, and I do think that there are circumstances in which quiet quitting, as long as you are also working on something else with that freed up, you know, mental space or just maybe literal time in your day makes a lot of sense for sure. I could absolutely see that. And I actually have an example of that um, in my own life that I think would lend, lend credence to that perspective. I don't know what you've been sipping, but you've got it all wrong. It's time to commit to the leaf. We've embraced the smoothness and surprising pick-me-up that tea provides. I literally drink it all day long, nearly a gallon a day, and it powers me through research, script writing, and forums on websites that I refuse to name here. But we don't drink normie NPC tea. We drink cultured and refined anime tea from the Dragon's Treasure. Kevin still likes the gunpowder green called Space Cowboy, and I've sampled nearly 40 Dragon's Treasure teas at this point. Lately, I've been slamming black teas like Kentucky Bourbon and Liquefied Berserk Despair. Scottish Breakfast is deep and peaty, and I smooth it over with Sebastian's Morning Earl Grey, which has the best vanilla cream taste I think I've ever had in a cup. Give me a pot of that with a hot meatball sub from Sal's Pizza and Brooks Barbecue Chicken to wash down my last meal on death row. I highly recommend the sampler packs. You'll want to try everything just like I did. I literally have not had one tea that I wouldn't be happy to reorder. The Dragon's Wings membership fuels new tea experimentation and the Tea of the Month Club provides a regularly scheduled surprise. And when you order from the Dragon's Treasure using code CREATE, you'll get 10% off your order. That's 10% off using the code CREATE at thedragonstreasure.com. The link's in the description. But before we get to that, I want to introduce a new term, which is quiet grinding. Now, quiet grinding. This is (laughs) the antithesis concept to quiet quitting, which is simply put to be quiet and work as hard as you can. Now, I have a couple of instances in my life in which this was instilled into me and when I saw its benefits firsthand. Uh, One one of which was actually, oddly enough, during my internship with Late Night with Conan O'Brien, where during, uh, there were like, there was like an introduction sort of, um, meeting with Conan and then sort of an outro conclusion meeting with Conan. There was no interaction with him in the middle of that, but during the introduction part of it, he flat out told us that essentially quiet quitting is what always worked for him. And that that's a method that he, I mean, he didn't put it in those terms. This is just a new Mm -hmm. phrase that we're, we're going to use. But the terms that he put it in was essentially that he, you know, put his head down and worked as hard as he possibly could. And he was justly rewarded for that throughout his life, whether it was, you know, becoming the head of the National Lampoon at at Harvard or, I mean, even getting into Harvard, uh, then going on to, you know, writing for uh, The Simpsons and then, you know, his own show. That was the edict by which he believed uh, uh, his success came and he was essentially bestowing that upon all of the interns that he, this was his piece of advice you know it was like his time to give a piece of advice to a group of like 25 college kids who didn't know what they're doing with their lives and his moment to give us a piece of advice was to say basically be quiet and work really hard and eventually someone will notice and give you an opportunity That you wouldn't have gotten otherwise, that you're not going to get by being, you know, noisy and lazy, (laughs) which I guess are the opposite, you know, of being quiet and grinding. 
I think that's fair advice. That's that's pretty good. Uh, I do. I do feel like every little detail of this whole concept from quiet quitting to quiet grinding, there's this little thing in, in the back of my head that's like, yeah, but what about this? So like the quiet part on quiet grinding, you can be too quiet. You, you can wait around for somebody to notice and they don't, you know, there's uh, it's appropriate to have a few pops of loudness in that quiet grinding. But I, I mean, I understand that that's that's not the concept that's being push there. It's like, just get your job done and, and don't, you know, make a big deal out of it. Um, yeah. Charles says in the chat, what I'm basically saying is a closed mouth doesn't get fed. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, that kind of thing. Uh, you don't ask, you don't get, but yeah, generally uh, I got to be on board with that, that y- you just do what's asked of you, do it well, do it on time, do it reliably, and then ask for more. We talked about this with Ben last week because Ben has exemplified quiet grinding. You know, uh, I brought up how um, we asked if he had an interest in analytics uh, certification or anything like that. And without without telling us or without us asking in a couple days, he'd done all three. And Kevin, you must, you know, remember when we got the, <laughs> the email forwards on the certificates, we were like, uh, that's what you do. You do a thing and then ask, okay, now what? Yeah. And so absolutely agree with you that you can be too quiet. I mean, if you're just grinding away in an attic somewhere <laughs> by yourself with, yeah. with like super long fingernails and toenails and like a, a gross beard, um, that's probably not going to lead to much. You know, I think probably yeah. Emily Dickinson was a, a quiet grinder and nobody found her poetry until, you know, posthumously, but they did. So, I mean, it kind of did work out for her. She just doesn't know about it. Uh, But I'll give you, so I'll give you the second example that is a very understandable and and tangible example of a quiet grinder. A guy that I worked with at the chicken wing restaurant that I worked at back in the day, uh, a cook, a cook on the line. So this place had a bunch of cooks. I mean, uh, let's see. I don't know exactly off the top of my head, but let's say there were like a rotating cast of 18 cooks maybe worked at this place. Okay. And as you can imagine, if anybody has familiarity with the restaurant industry, people who work in restaurants are freaking all over the place. They are almost (laughs) always trying to do something else. Almost, almost always. They are doing the restaurant thing in order to pay the bills while they pursue whatever, an acting career or being a painter or musician or, or whatever it is. In my, in my personal experience, God, half the people that I worked with had a band <laughs> at this, at this chicken wing place. <laughs> they like all had a band, but this one guy, this one guy who was the, the, the quietest grinderest person that I worked with always picked up everybody else's shifts. So when somebody had a gig and they didn't want to work or they couldn't work or, you know, something else came up. They wanted to go to a show. This dude, this one guy is who you, you, you went to. Everyone knew. We all knew. All like 18 of us knew or whatever. If we wanted to skip out on a shift, we would just ask this dude and he would say yes. Not some of the time. Every time. Every time. To the point where, I kid you not, this dude was working double shifts probably four days a week, like, like, like probably more than half of the time every week he was working doubles. So, uh, awesome. a, a, a double, if, if somebody doesn't know is that, you know, you know, you would work the morning shift and the night shift, you, you would work the whole damn day. So you'd work, you'd open this, you'd open the restaurant, <laughs> work all day and then close the restaurant, work, work all night and then close the restaurant. He would do this all the time. Well, after, I don't know, a year or so of doing that, and there was an opening for, uh, they were opening a new restaurant because the place was so successful, uh, not least of which because this dude was grinding so hard in helping make it be very successful. He played a, a, a statistically significant role in its success. The I place bet, yeah. up, opened up a new, bigger, better, beautiful location. They were upgrading. And guess who was asked to be the manager of the new location, which came with full benefits and a a nice fat salary 
and it was a great right. a great job. So he went from you know getting paid hourly um, and maybe getting some tips here and there to getting a full time salaried position with full benefits, health care, everything covered, uh, managing this beautiful new restaurant. It's like this was not a coincidence. This dude was not quiet quitting. That is why he got this opportunity because he was quiet grinding. The place thrived and he ended up getting a role in and sort of reaping the rewards of his hard labor. Like don't for a second think that what he did for the one restaurant didn't help influence expanding to another one. Oh, absolutely. And, and I want to say that that happens a lot more often than people think. Like I just said a few minutes ago that it, you can be overlooked if you're too quiet when you grind. But no, generally it, it, it comes out and the people who should notice do notice. When I think back to literally every job or task I've ever had, it's, it started with quiet grinding really. And then, uh, and then somebody notices, I mean, it, but it's, it's not. By, by noticing, it makes it sound like this kind of faceless random thing. No, no. It's like people are happy when you've completed the project that uh, that you said you were going to complete. And they want that to happen again. That's why they notice, because it's awesome. Uh, they, they want to take advantage of your talent. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's like, no, this is a, a good resource that's going to you know, improve the restaurant, uh, whatever it is. Uh, I see in the the chat, Jen says, uh, quiet grinding is how she went from intern to director in three years. Yup. There you go. That's how it works. I, I I did quiet grinding with you. Uh, didn't I, Kevin, where it was like, where we we would talk about scripts and stuff like that and, and eventually do a little more and do a little more. And, uh, you know, it, it built up to something. But it's because uh, I was useful enough when we did that <laughs> for you to want it to happen again. Um, that that turned into something bigger precisely because it, it was, you know, you've got a task, get that task done and then go on to the next task. Yeah. Wh- while you were doing, you know, another job full time, I would throw more yeah. work at you. And you said yes every single time. I, there was never a single no. There was never a single like Ah, uh, sorry. You know, I uh, uh, there was this thing I wanted to do instead, or whatever. It was always like, yeah, sure, let's do it, mm-hmm. and that works. <laughs> like it just, it just does. And I, I, yeah. I don't, I don't mean to uh, like almost oversimplify it, but it needs to be said. It needs to be said simply for the mm-hmm. fact that nobody says it. I mean, I don't hear this message. I hear the opposite almost all the time. And 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 I, I also think it's important to say. Again, sort of what my coworker did, which is, you know, work really hard at what uh, he was asked to do, do more than he was asked to do. And then that business thrived and opened up an opportunity for him. That, that's how it works in any small business. You know, I don't know how it works being employee 75,000 at Amazon. I, I, do, I have no idea. You know, this is a different discussion. But if your employee like seven or even, you know, 32, uh, there's a lot of room for growth based upon the success of the place where you're working. If you are willing to put in the work to help it get there. And if you are part of that success, who else are they going to reward for that? They're literally they have to reward you. you. First of all, you don't even understand how hard it is. For, for that employer to find somebody as good as you, if they wanted to even replace you for some reason, it would be really hard and really expensive. The easiest thing for them to do is say, hey, Matt is awesome at this. He is vital to our growth. And now that we have growth and we have this new position that is a more senior position, let's hire Matt for it. And then, oh, wow, magically, now you have a better job. <laughs> it just I keep, I keep thinking like all the way back, and I mean all the way back here. Um, I think back to being probably fifteen, uh, some time ago, where I was working uh, doing cruddy stuff for a guy, you know, raking leaves and and hauling things around and and just 
grunt work uh, and getting a few bucks for it. Um, it was nothing special. And he asked me to, he asked me to polish, uh, the tacks on a wooden canoe. So it, imagine this, uh, an old, very old canoe that is built in strips and there are copper tacks all the way, uh, around this, holding it together. There were probably between four and 5,000 tacks, um, on the, on that canoe. And they hadn't been polished in a long time. Copper, uh, oxidates, uh, turns green like the statue of Liberty. And it has to be clean to look awesome again. And the prospect of doing it one by one, this was not the kind of thing you could sandblast. You couldn't even just take sandpaper and go uh, sweeping motions to sand the canoe. You had to go, uh, take something the size of uh, a pencil eraser and polish that piece of that size with precision. Well, 4,000 of those takes a long time and it is the most tedious, sucky thing in the world. Uh, but that was the job. That's what he needed done. And I did two things. I started it. I kept doing it uh, and then figured out um, some, some jewelry polishing techniques. Uh, I did some research on that to use jeweler's tools to automate uh, add a little bit of machinery to the process. So it was precision machinery as opposed to precision manual. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the 4,000 tacks, it was a little bit of a, a Mr. Miyagi uh, sand my deck kind of thing. Uh, he, he said, well, this is really good. I, I want, you know, instead of just doing yard work, uh, I'd like to do real woodworking and canoe work uh, with you. And it was fantastic. It, it launched, um, it launched my interest in, in woodworking and metalworking that I, uh, I'm still doing now. I mean, it, it was fantastic. And I got to work with a master, an absolute master, uh, who, yeah, in the, in the canoe world, especially he was, he was the world's expert on, on canoes. And that happened because I just kind of put my head down and, polished a, a lot of tacks in a, a very cold workshop which was uh, like an entry level test so so what 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 is the point of that yeah. what is the point of asking you to to polish 4000 tacks what 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 is the point of you doing menial like entry level work here is the point it's not complicated there are two things that everybody needs to know about their employee it's really simple. One, can you be trusted? That is a big one. Can I trust yep. you? Can I trust that you'll do what you say you're going to do when you're going to do it? Can I trust that you'll show up for t uh, for work on time? Can I trust that you will do the work that needs to be done in the time that it needs to be done in an efficient manner and the way that it needs to be done? Can I tr so trust is the big thing. That's a headline quality. The second is discipline. Like, are you disciplined enough to see the thing through? Do you give up? Um, are you instead like impulsive and unable to, you know, delay gratification for a payoff later? Okay. Those are red flags. Like if you're not disciplined and I can't trust you, see ya. <laughs> like you're gone. Pretty much. I cannot work with you. I will find somebody else. And like, I don't care if you're my best friend. I don't care how funny you are or how like well you get along with the coworkers or anything. Like if I cannot trust you and you're undisciplined, you're not going to be a good employee and you're not going to go very far. So you have to at least pass like those two hurdles in order to progress. So those are really easy hurdles to clear if you are mindful of them, at least in my estimation. Like if you know that being trustworthy is a, a good thing <laughs> and being disciplined in your work is a good thing. Well, guess what? Now you have a leg up on the people who don't know that or are incapable of doing that. And you're all of a sudden light years ahead of the people, you know, in line for the next promotion. The I want to break. OK, OK, Sorry, no, no. One. No, no, no. I was going to change oh, the subject. I, oh, okay. I wanted to bring in some of the things that the chat was saying, because there's this general feeling that if you have to quit quietly or you want to do quiet quitting, it's a failure of, of management in some way, being uninspiring or sucky to work for or 
making you not want to do it. Um, a few people uh, pointed that out, and I think that's that's true to a degree. Charles Kahn also said the opposite thing a long time back, half an hour ago, that that if he has a job to do, he wants to do it well because he doesn't feel good about himself when he doesn't. I, I, I work that same way, too. If I do a shitty job on something, I don't feel good. So even if um, uh, the the person at the top, the person you know putting the job out, it can be a client as well. Uh, are uninspiring or bothersome or sometimes just plain offensive. Don't you want to do the best job you can? Uh, you don't. You don't necessarily want to rein it back and phone it in. You won't feel pride in yourself when you do that. Uh, and I think that maintaining that feeling of of pride is more important to you than knowing that you're doing something for somebody who sucks. Um, is that? What do you think about that, Kevin? Is that on the money or is that off in some way? No, I, I, well, I'm, I think that that's ultimately true. I understand what the chat is saying. I have worked for mm -hmm. managers who I really didn't like, and it it at times uh, was difficult to say like, yeah, why don't I cut corners on this? Like, I, I, I hate this guy, you know, he doesn't care. So why should I? I, I totally get that. I sympathize with that fully. Absolutely. And, and. I think that that makes a lot yeah, of sense. I, I get that. I get that. Uh, on the other hand, certainly, I think the ideal scenario is what you just said. The ideal scenario is to, again, I'm going to use this word, discipline yourself to mm -hmm. do a good job in spite of that person. Like, do not rely yeah. upon their acceptance in order to be trustworthy and disciplined in what you need to accomplish because I think this is a habit, a habit forming thing. I think it's like exercising. I think that if you fall out of the habit of doing a good job and taking pride in what you do, it's, it could be easy for that to bleed out into other areas of your life that will make those areas of your life worse in which you're not taking care of yourself very well. You're not taking care of your living situation very well. Maybe you're not taking care of your family very well. And, and, and I'm speaking in generalities here, of course, of course. But, but it I, is general. I, it's a general I, thing. Yeah, yeah. and I, I just, I, I believe that um, I see this with artists all the time. And, and, let, and we can circle back right now to the, <laughs> the point of this podcast, being creative, being an online creator, no matter what it is that you're doing, making something and meaning something, the first person that has to care is you. You have to care first, no matter what you're making. If you don't care, I can absolutely guarantee you nobody else will care. It's impossible. It's not possible for someone else to yeah. care if you don't care. So if other people not caring is preventing you from caring, this is the same relationship as with the work thing. It's the same dynamic. If other people's influence over you is getting you to change your behavior, that's a problem. It's a problem that you're, you're not going to be able to dig your way out of until you get to a point in which you care enough as a baseline to do the thing that, that you can take pride in and derive meaning from and then start to get other people to also like what you do. It can't really work any other way. It just won't. You're waiting on a miracle if you do it any other way. You're waiting on other people to change the way they do things and all of these things to line up for you and for them for it to just click. And I guess that happens. I'm sure it happens now and then uh, the stars align in, in such a way where everybody's happy and productive all of a sudden. But guess what? That doesn't really work. And even if it did, the odds are so low, you, you would be dumb to try to play it that way and hope that it worked out. Uh, but I think that point that you made, Kevin, about um, about it being generally connected to so many things like, like exercise or whatever, uh, that's the biggest point to me about all of this, that that you have to approach everything with this same attitude because it spills over. And so as a highly specific example, people in the Discord know that I like to talk about mowing. I like talking about um, how I cut the grass, what it's like to cut the grass, how long it takes me, reducing that time, uh, all sorts of things related to mowing. 
that's not actually about mowing. I, I kind of, I guess it's nice to have a manicured lawn, but I ultimately don't care. If I could have the grass grow up into hay to my kneecaps, I'd be happy enough. Uh, it's not about that. It's something that I can put effort in and organize a bit and feel good about the outcome of. And I want to do that with everything else. I want to eat right. I want to sleep well. I want to do the things with the people I love that keep them loving me. I mean, all of all of those things are the same process in a different way. Uh, it there's no difference. There's just no difference. And I don't think I don't think I've ever I've ever legitimately thought of doing quiet quitting on anything, any job, or anyone. Um, and it happens a lot with people. I mean, uh, how many times do you talk to somebody who uh, gets out of a relationship and they were like, yeah, you know, I've known it was uh, over for like four months. Well, yeah, because you or they pulled this quiet quitting shit. <laughs> uh, right. You know, if that was the case, instead of quitting quietly, uh, maybe you, <laughs> you know, maybe you break up with them and and sort it out. Uh, you know, do the clean break and, and get on with things. Or if you can't because you need places to live or something like that, then you start the process. But whatever it is, you don't sit there sulking, doing the bare minimum to get by until it falls apart and your force or your hand is forced in some way. This is not good. This is not good in literally any facet of your life at all. No, no, it, it's really not. And it does bleed over to other things. So that that's why I think it is important to also just not focus this on whatever your job is, because it's, it's, you know, it's keeping your work area clean and organized or, yeah. you know, your room tidy yeah. or uh, whatever, doing your laundry and folding it and putting it away, <laughs> not just letting it pile up because who cares? Because the answer is makes you should care. You have to care. Yeah. You, you have to care because that's where all of the good things come from. It starts with you caring. We want to help you make something and mean something. And we say that phrase all the time because when you're making something and you know it means something, even if it's just to you, that's when you feel pretty good about what you're creating. The support for the Create Unknown in recent weeks has been incredible. Animators, artists, musicians, YouTubers, aspiring filmmakers, comedians, it is crazy how talented everybody in this community is. Consider joining the Create Unknown Patreon. Every dollar that comes through goes straight into the podcast and its community. That means more highlights videos. It means a big Minecraft project that's on the way. And eventually we'd like to manufacture custom piss bottles so you never have to leave your battle station. And being a patron unlocks participation in all of our live recordings. You've seen the roster of guests we've had. Having access to their minds is a unique opportunity. You can go to patreon.com slash thecreateunknown or click the link that's in the description. Every little bit helps and your support means absolutely everything to us. Patreon.com slash thecreateunknown. Links in the description. We appreciate you, Space Cowboys. How... Okay, I want to press you on this, Kevin. Uh, how... How do you start to care when you, when you actually don't? Because it's, I, I am comfortable saying that I've been in spots where I just did not care about anything. Like truly, I, I, and I don't mean that to sound like super weirdly depressive. It, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like a, a clinical state, but there was nothing I cared at. And I've, I've talked multiple times about how I'm not, I don't think in terms of goals, uh, I, I don't have big goals that I, that I want to do. And that makes it easy to not care when you just hit a point where nothing really matters, whether it's your lawn or your laundry, uh, or, uh, grinding out some art. How, when you do not care, do you begin the process? Well, I would kind of turn the concept around a little bit. And that is to say that you nothing you will never like it is 100% a negative feedback loop like if you you don't care and nothing matters then nothing will matter and you'll never care i think that if you have any interest in anything going well for you you have to put in the effort in order for that to occur like you have to start somewhere like some at some point and it can be small um it can be deciding that you want to dress differently like maybe you want to um, dress a little nicer 
than you have been in the past. You know, get some new clothes. Maybe you could start with that because that has a lot to do, like how you present yourself has a lot to do with how you are received. That's that's the point of yeah. fashion, folks. I don't know if you ever thought about what the point of fashion is. It's not too complicated. Aside from clothing your nude body, uh, uh, <laughs> but but that's not fashion. That's just clothes, clothes, right? Yeah. Um, fashion is uh, it's a it's a signal. It's an interpersonal signal between you and other people that again has to do largely actually with trust and and it has like you know th- th- things on beneath trust like uh relatability and um you know your own personality those those sort of things are part of it as well uh i would say those are kind of subsidiary elements the main thing is trust okay. like if you decide to dress um uh, here's a good example if anyone's ever seen ace ventura and he goes to like the psychiatric ward and he's wearing like a pink tutu and his hair is all crazy and he's talking about you know his football playing days okay that's the that he (laughs) he was doing something very specifically wacky so that they wouldn't trust him that he was of sound mind that was the point of that Uh, i think like the other side of like the stark pendulum swing is wearing a suit. So you wear a suit, you know, you have a tie and a suit, and that's like a uniform of professionalism, business attire. What, what does that mean? Well, that means that I'm, I'm trustworthy uh, I, I, on some level, at least by appearances. Maybe I'm a snake oil salesman and you shouldn't trust me at all and I'm a con man. But and in terms of my fashion, I am signaling to you that I'm trustworthy because I can afford this suit. It's clean. It looks nice. Like I know how to wear it properly and it's tailored properly, whatever you get the point. But why do you, you think, Oh, sorry, go on. Um, so, so I just wanted to button that by saying like you, no matter where you start or like you said, like perhaps it's eating better, you know, maybe you feel like mm-hmm. you're, you're tired all the time and that might have something to do with your diet. So you want some more energy. You're tired of feeling tired. And maybe, you know, you're eating too many carbs and too much sugar and you should look into cutting back on some of that. Or, you know, you're you're drinking too much uh, soda and you just supplement that with water Um, and and you just start with that. But at at some point you have to make a, a value judgment, a decision that is to say something uh, in my life could be better and I'm going to follow that path and see where it leads. And maybe it will actually lead to better results for me. And then you can stack those and hopefully eventually, aside from, you know, catastrophe that is unavoidable, which everyone will run into. Mm. It's about the things that you can control. And it's like, if you can control things in a better way than you are now, why would you not do that? I don't know. You're right that... You're right that it's on a short list of things that you can control. Your performance, you can control that. You showing up on time, you can generally control that. Um, sometimes life circumstances make it really tough to pull off, but build that in. I was in a, I was in a group chat, and I, a couple of people uh, in here might might know about this, but uh, we were kind of uh, gently ribbing a YouTuber who who was. Uh, complaining about approval. I think it was, I think videos being, uh, being greenlit, you know, awaiting review and getting through that process. It's like, this takes, you know, 36 hours every time or something like 72 hours. Uh, well, that sucks. That is odd and unfair and the review should be very quick, but here's the reality. It isn't. And this has happened to you 25 times in a row. If you need to release this thing on Thursday, in reality, you've got to have it uploaded on Monday then. Build this into the process. Stick with the thing that you can control. It's not, you know, it's not uh, a terribly complex thing, but it's hard to do that. And I think in, excuse me, I think in his case, he's resentful over the fact that he would have to do that, that he would have to finish three days earlier because something else wasn't going the way it should. That's accurate. And that's. I think he's right to feel that way, but you still got to do it. I mean, the, the actual outcome 
is not going to be improved by your resentment. It will be improved by your adjustment. There's a really big difference between those two things. Uh, and the signaling point that you made is, is also massive. Something like exercise. Think of all the things that people do to exercise versus doing those in real life. Like 98% of exercise is stuff you don't do. When was the last time you needed to do a jumping jack in life? No, probably <laughs> never. You've almost never had to push your body up off the ground, making sure your knees don't touch it. Like you've gotten up under your own power. You've had to do that quite a lot. Uh, the closest really is moving things and, and lifting, lifting stuff. But even that is not exactly the same thing as lifting weights. You know, doing a, a bench press is uh, with a bar as opposed to, you know, you're probably not lifting a bar if you're uh, pressing in real life. Anyway, nobody questions this. Everybody knows that this activity is going to pay off in another way. They don't they don't say, well, I, I, I I'm going to just not do jogging because like eh, I, I don't have to run. No, you probably don't have to run for your life very often. But you do have to go out for a day and not get dog tired. <laughs> it sucks when you're with somebody, you know, on a, you go somewhere on a Saturday and you're out all day. And, uh, it's a lot better to be, you know, high on energy and pounding through the day at 4 PM instead of like, Oh, I want to sit on a bench cause I'm tired. Guess what? The person who exercised and do and did all of these things unrelated to the day, uh, is still popping off, you know, going into the evening. It, it's the same thing, and everybody knows it works this way, but when you bring it to something like being at a desk, uh, being in an office, working on YouTube videos, you're like, oh, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. Of course it does. Of course it works that way, and if you think it isn't, you're an idiot. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. The unseen, the unseen benefits on the exercise are obvious, but on, I mean, <clears throat> on the work stuff, it's not. I... I I wanted to mention uh, two things really quick. One is this figure that I've read several times, and it, it came up again recently uh, in, in a like a Twitter thread, Matt, that you actually shared with me. And it has to do essentially with this, and that is uh, the what we're talking about does not require it does not require being my friend at the chicken wing place who worked a hundred hours a week like like a, a madman, uh, not at all. The fact is, and I've seen this figure a lot, and maybe some people have heard this as well, but it, but only 10% more work leads to more than double mm. pr productivity. And productivity can also lead to things like a higher, higher salary, higher pay. Yeah. So don't think that, you know, quiet grinding means that you need to work twice as hard as everybody else. It can literally be 10%. 10% is all it can take in order to compound over time to being right. hugely, hugely beneficial to you. So, you know, it's it's not like any anyone is suggesting that you should have no, no free time or no, you know, don't spend any time with your kids or your friends or anything like that. It's like a little bit more. A little bit more and you get a bit. huge benefit out of that. Yeah, I, I know uh, it's I, I don't know who who said this, but it's one of those Gary Vee ish type things where it's like, you know, do one percent more today than you did yesterday. And the idea is that you don't need to push it very hard. You just have to do a tiny, tiny little bit more. And if you do the tiniest little bit more each day, it compounds so spectacularly over time. It is insane. It is crazy how much uh, how much the tiniest bit of effort compounds. And that's, you know, I'm talking micro effort. I'm not even talking 10%. To me, 10% is huge. It's still not very much, especially when you're talking about doubling productivity by a 10% boost on a thing, which I completely believe, by the way. I don't think that is just plain, uh, just plain math. I think that's absolutely accurate. Uh, that production probably doubles with a ten percent increase, but just a tiny, tiny sliver of increase over yesterday—that's it. You're done. You're good. You do that every day, and things are 
amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not even like quiet grinding has to be this thing that just, you know, takes over your life, which is the point of quiet quitting is to not have work take over your life. Well, look, you do not have to have it take over your life in order to see compounding benefits and studies bear this out. The, the other thing I wanted to say before we wrap up this concept is... Oh, I want to say something more too, though. Okay. Okay, good. Well, let, let me just hit this first and then you can chime in. Yeah. Is um, I'll, I'll throw in a, a, a different scenario for our creatives who are listening that is from my own personal experience that's a, a little bit um, against the uh, quiet grinding idea in a way, but it's sort of navigating it differently. So when I was in my days of working at this chicken wing place and this guy who was working next to me ended up going on to becoming a full-time manager with benefits and everything like that. I did not want to do that. That was not of interest to me. I did not want to stay on and work at this chicken wing place. I didn't want to move up. And I've had, a, a, you know, a couple of jobs. I, I had a, another job at that time. Uh, at a, I, and I told this story actually I think where the the manager of the club that I worked at was like mad at me when I first started working uh, for Google because I was making a bad decision by leaving the club because I could have moved up within that it was a it was a pretty big um company you know in the in the area that had a lot of different restaurants and clubs and he saw me as manager material that could have moved up uh within the company and been running one of these you know clubs or um, restaurant someday. And, and, and by, you know, leaving that it was a mistake, which to this day I found at that time I found very funny. And to this day I find very funny. And the reason I find that funny is because I had no interest in that. And if people are listening and they know for a fact that like, look, man, I don't want to quite grind at this job because I, I, I know like deep within my soul that I don't want the more more responsibility. I don't want to move up in this company. It's not of interest to me. Mm -hmm. I want to focus my time and energy on something else. Let me just say that I get it. I get that too, because that's exactly what I did. And and, and I did it in a very specific way though that still was quiet grinding. And, and here's how that went. So uh, if anybody knows... Uh, anything about working in restaurants. And I'm sure this is also the same thing working in an office or maybe even working in a hospital. I, I don't know, but I know from my experience working in restaurants after work, everybody would go out together. That was what everybody did. So you'd, you'd work your shift, you'd clean up, you'd, you'd lock up, and then you'd go to a bar or you go to somebody's house or you go to a diner whatever it was and everybody would then hang out for another few hours because that's that was part of the deal that was like the, the that's the culture sure that's the culture you all you know you work together yeah. and then you hang out together and you decompress i skipped out on that part almost completely skipped out on that part when i was done with work i left work and i went home and i went back to work on what i wanted to work on so i would write I would shoot videos, I would draw comics, I would be creative by myself in my apartment while everybody else was, you know, drinking and partying and uh, socializing. Uh, I went to what I considered my real job, which was a job I didn't get paid a dime for for many years, but that was what I considered my real job. And that's what I did my quiet grinding on uh, after the job that actually paid my bills. There are a lot of hours in a week. What is it? 168? Does that, does that math check out? 7, 140, 168. Uh, let's, let's give you nine hours of sleep. Uh, so that's 63. We're down to 105 hours. Um, how long, how many, uh, how many hours a week do you think is appropriate to still be a gamer for playing video games? Well, like how many, give me a number here, Kevin. Oh, in my opinion, an hour a day is enough to be a gamer. So eight hours a okay. week. Let's call it 10. Sure. Uh, you play video games 10 hours a week. Now you're down to 95 hours. Let's give you two hours a day for eating and showering and all the necessities in life. And we'll round that up to 15. So now we're down to 80 hours a week. Let's say you work 50 hours a week. 
you do, you overperform, you have a boss that is dragging you in and forces you to grind, not just 40, but you're up to 50. So what is that down to now? 30 hours remaining. Uh, and that's covered all of life and work and sleep, uh, the basics. Um, 20 hours a week with spending time with, with family and friends and stuff like that. 20 hours is a hell of a lot of time yeah. in one week. But I'm going to go really high on these really uh, conservative estimates uh, on, on time remaining is what I'm after. And that still leaves 10 hours a week that you could grind away on whatever project you want. Right. Like I just laid out, I laid out sleeping more than the average person does, working more than the average person does, generous amount of time to take care of life's necessities, generous amount of time to play video games and hang out with friends and family. And you still have like 90 minutes a day that you can do something with. If you don't have time, you're a boner. <laughs> if, you, if you think you don't have time, you either have a really crazy life set up. And that is totally possible. Like Kevin and I have had a lot of conversations. We had one today about how, how crazy life can get. Um, usually that's temporary. And if it's not, you know, you need to figure out why not. Uh, but you, you definitely go through periods where you don't have the time or the energy to, to do whatever your thing is. But generally, generally, if you can't put 10 hours a week into the thing, it is on you. You are blowing it. You are managing your time like an idiot. Uh, you're inefficient. And it's not like you have to hyper schedule things. No, it's not. It's not about that. It's just recognizing that you have so much time and you make choices with that time. Just like Kevin said, I could go out and drink with the work friends from the restaurant where I can take four hours and go home and do this other thing. Maybe it's going four hours, go home and, and sleep, or maybe it's hanging out with your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever, um, whatever, but you're making a choice to, to not do, uh, whatever those things are to do the hangout. You didn't want to, well, that's the opportunity cost. And you don't have to be hyper analytical to think in this way. You just have to be really general common sensey to be like, what else could I be doing right now? What could I be doing tonight? Um, God, it, it's, uh, I, I talk to so many people who spend more time talking about the thing they want to do than doing the yes, thing. Yes. Thank you. I wanted to bring that up. They, thank, they you. Wanted to. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Know, that is it, such a good topic. Yes. Thank you. Before we get into that, I want to say base weight said, yeah, what else could I be doing right now? Honestly? Yes. That's the pressure that, that we have that Kevin and I have on this podcast is if somebody's going to take the time to be at the live show or to listen to the podcast, what are they not doing? What are they not doing instead? And it has to be good enough. It has to be worthwhile enough that they've made a good decision. Um, I, I did a, a, a thing in Australia, uh, where I, I, told you this is where I hung out with Tom and many kudos and a bunch of very good people there. And, and I explained that the reality, they were talking about competition and doing searches, uh, to, to figure out who your competition is on YouTube. Your competition is not on YouTube. Your competition is the internet. When you're making a YouTube video or you're making a podcast, you're, you're not competing against another creator. You're competing against, uh, against Pornhub and PlayStation fours and fives. Uh, and Netflix and literally anything else you can do on the internet. That's the reality. And you have to do, you have to, you have to recognize that everybody is making these choices all the time, that when they're doing one thing, they have made a choice not to do any multitude of others. Uh, you just have to get in that mindset for yourself where it's like, yes, I am eating this thing and I am not eating these 40 other things which may be better, may be worse. I don't know. You got to think about it. I'm hanging out with this person, which means I'm not spending time with this other one. Uh, it's a constant juggling of opportunity cost. And when you get in the habit of thinking in that way, uh, and, and I know Jen, especially in the chat, recognize this, recognizes this as being like an economic way of thinking, because it is. It's about choices. And trade-offs. Everything gets, yeah, and trade-offs. Yeah, everything gets easier. Because it makes, it makes sense. Like your choices make sense. You're not just doing a thing blind because yeah, you think you should do it. No, you're doing it because it's a better option than a X, Y, and Z. 
or you're not doing X, Y, or Z because you know this this other thing actually is more important. And it's a mindset that pervades literally everything. If you can think in those terms and gently weigh the alternatives for what you're doing and how you're spending your time, doesn't mean that you have to be the most productive and efficient person of all time. Last night, uh, I, I thought, uh, do I want to read a book or do I want to watch this football game? Well, I know reading the book is better for my life than watching the Giants Cowboys game, but I chose that because I I felt like I ne- kind of needed it. You know, I, I needed to hang out and relax and fall asleep. And, and that worked. That was good. So it's not like you always have to choose the craziest uh, productive thing. Um, and choose some loser stuff. That's why I built in the video games in that estimate, because that's real life. That's how uh, that's how people live. And that's what they need. They need goofy stuff. But it is something that you've got to think all the time. And I think that with quiet, quiet quitting, I mean, to bring this back to the the main thing, like what is the alternative here in the alternative of quiet grinding, whether it's getting in the habit of, of something or uh, feeling pride in what you do or getting better at it, because you know what's easier than working hard, being really, really good at what you do when you're awesome at something. Work isn't very hard. This mm-hmm. is something we were talking about before the podcast. Kevin and I were talking in a, a different context about it. But get good at what you do. And it, that's actually easier than figuring out how to do the bare minimum. It is so much easier to get really good at something and do it than it is to mess around with doing less. It's a little paradoxical in that doing more and getting better will lead to more free time and all of that. But it will. It will. It absolutely will. The, the work that I've done physically uh, outside has bought me more time to do actual desk work. I'm more alert. I, I estimated that I've gained about two hours a day in productivity compared to six months ago, and I'm spending a lot of time on things that have nothing to do with work, and I'm still getting two hours a day because I, I didn't do quiet quitting. I, I tried to be good at something and I tried to make smart decisions. So anyway, Kevin, back to the talking more than doing thing. But I, I needed I needed this rant very badly in my <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah. So that is a long time pet peeve of mine. And it's something that I've run into a lot over the years. A lot of people will talk about all of the projects they're going to do and all the ideas that they have. And then they do exactly none of them. And I think that that is a trap. It is a trap and it needs to be recognized, needs to be called out and it has to be recognized. Like people need to be aware of this trap where you could just get stuck in this like ideal loop of like, oh, I really, I'm going to do this, but I can't because I don't have this kind of camera or like, oh, I really, I'm definitely, I have this great idea, but I don't have this specific keyboard that I need or uh, this guitar or, you know, this tablet or whatever it is. Uh, Get out of that trap, please. Like, uh, unless this is some sort of like weird coping mechanism that you need (laughs) in order to make you feel like pseudo productive. It's not productive. It is it is just like mentally farting. That's all that is. It's like <laughs> mentally farting. Like congratulations on your brain gas. But that's about as valuable as brain that gas. is. Like please, even if it's true that you have this great idea for a feature length film, great. Uh, feature length yeah. films, as we know from Andrew Bowser, who we had on this podcast, are very expensive to make and uh, they take and if uh, you don't have millions of dollars uh, and you only have like say seven hundred thousand dollars even at that point you're asking for a lot of favors from friends and to work for free and blah 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 like forget it it's crazy make a 60 second short film for tiktok or youtube shorts i don't know make yeah. something build up towards the feature length film at some point you know mm-hmm. Uh, almost every director has made some sort of short film at some point that got into a festival and then maybe that leads to a connection in which they get the ability to make a feature. Whatever. The point is, is you have to start with what you can do. And that goes back to what we were saying earlier about controlling what you can control. 
Well, there's something that you can control. And if you can't control it, then it's not really of great value to be spinning your wheels about this project that you're going to do, but you can't yet. It's like, well, then stop talking about it and do the thing that you can yeah. do. I mean, you know, get away from me with this. Oh, uh, yeah, like I'm going to, you know, it's one thing to have like some lofty goal to work towards. That's fine. But in the meantime, be productive <laughs> in some capacity, because how else are you ever going to get to that? carrot at the end of the stick it's not gonna happen like oh. make something in the meantime please no and the people who you want to respect your idea fund your idea consider it help you with it any of those things i can guarantee that they if they don't have idea fatigue already they're on pace for it because anybody in that position hears 10 really legitimately good ideas every single day Oh, yeah. They hear it constantly. So the people who you would want to be most interested in your talk, they are the least interested in your talk. <laughs> so it really is completely useless. Not only does it just not matter in the way that Kevin completely detailed, but there's no chance. <laughs> there's literally no chance. I had this with my book uh, of, or I had the conversation yeah. with um, a book agent about sleep warrior uh -huh. and you know she asked what it was about i told her a general synopsis yep. i was like cool so like can i get an advance like what's the next step and it's and she's like oh the next step is you write the whole thing <laughs> that's the next yep. step yeah there's no yeah. there's no pitch there's no like sample chapters there's no uh advance there's no none of that write no. the entire book We'll see if it's any good or not, and then we'll go from there. It's like, oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Why did yeah. she say that? Because that's yeah. the process. They hear a, yeah, and, a billion no book ideas all day long, and they are worth nothing. Yep. Nothing. Yep. They really are nothing. not worth much. The crazy thing is even when they are, they aren't. So uh, here's an example, because uh, Kevin, I actually didn't tell you this. I pulled up last night. I think it was last night. Yeah, as I was watching this football game. I did a little noodling on on this games book that that we've played with for a long time. Um, the, the premise is tracking how games work and how, especially how uh, numbers and math affect games, starting with the simplest simplest game in human history, all the way up to Minecraft, and it's uh, it's pretty neat. It's broken into uh, about thirteen chapters. Well, with a book like that, you can give a, a proposal that is an outline. Uh, and let's say two or three sample chapters, something that, that details your full idea and then gives them a sample of it. So that's a case where you can get away with not writing the whole book before you, you ship it out. However, if somebody really likes it, their next step is to ask for the book. So you might as well have it done. You <laughs> might as well Finish the thing before you go into that proposal stage, because the one time it does matter, the very next thing that happens is going to be they want to see the, the, the work that you've been talking about. So in the best case scenario, this still doesn't work. It's still inferior to what Kevin's saying that you just do the thing. Yeah. And I mean, in my experience with TV, it has been the same thing. It's like, oh, that's a really cute idea. Now, you know, unless you put a bunch of production effort into at least coming up yep. with some sort of sizzle reel so I can see what the thing is going to look like, mm -hmm. then once again, your cute little log line is worth zilch, all caps, less than zilch. zilch, it's worth nothing. It's less, it's a liability because somebody has to spend the time considering your idea at the expense of doing something else or thinking about something else. That's the case of the opportunity cost kicking in and your idea is actually a liability to them. It is worth less than zero. It is costing them time and effort. <laughs> it is. It is. And then it will cost you time and effort to realize the thing into, you know, a four to five minute sizzle reel teaser um, just on the hopes that they like it enough to buy, you know, a pilot of it. And then at that point, they have yeah. to like it enough to buy a run of it. I mean, it's a, it's a process. It's a long process. And the point of that is that each step of that process requires showing your work. 
it's like you have to actually show yep. your work. It's not just nothing is based on just ideas. So at some point you have to show your work, you have to make something and uh, then you can go from there. Um, yep. All right. I'm glad that you brought that up. It was not something I had written down, but it was something I thought about earlier today is that av try to avoid uh, unless you are using the saying what you're going to do as a coping <laughs> mechanism for something. Mm -hmm. um, if you actually want to progress in a creative career, uh, don't get stuck in the what you're going to do trap and actually do stuff because yeah. uh, there's a difference. Yeah. Um, okay. I know that we have a couple of questions from our patrons if you want to uh, throw those out. Yeah. They're related to this. Uh, the first one's from base weight who, by the way, got a 45 minute gig coming up. That's a lot of, that's a lot of Whoa. time for the music. Wow. Yeah. That's a long ass set. Uh, so that's a step up and yeah, I was really excited. I saw that, uh, first thing I saw when I woke up today, I opened the phone and, and checked out the messages yeah, and congrats. saw that. And it, it's just, it's awesome. Yeah. It made me feel good getting into the day. Well, he says, is there harm in building up a library of releases or content? Uh, because it, that's, that's gotta be a part of what cry, quiet grinding is besides just grinding by yourself in, you know, a, a cave, um, is, is that a valid strategy? I mean, is it the best strategy is, is my question to, to build up, uh, a bunch of chapters of your writing, uh, a bunch of videos, uh, scheduled in the queue on YouTube, just getting a body of work together by yourself without letting anybody see it like yeah secretly yeah. do a bunch I mean, of stuff and then release it at once yeah so so let's call it like invisible grinding as opposed to you know just putting your head down and working away but is there value in in doing it that way um just kind of self it, it's easy to think of this in terms of self-study yeah like let's say you want to learn a, a language like is there value in not really talking to anybody else in that language for a long time and just kind of grinding away at your Babel app or whatever you're doing. Uh, I think it's probably rare in, in, in which, in cases in which that that's more valuable than being present and iteratively um, sharing things with people and progressing because you're staying on, you know, top of mind. I think on some level, it's the Island, isn't it? That's being on the Island uh, is it, you know, something we talked about a very long time ago, but, but I think that's the question is, is, is there harm in hanging out on the island for a long time? I think so. I think, can it work out? Probably. I think that that would be uh, rare. I think, cause, cause think of, okay. think of this scenario. Okay. So this works for Bo Burnham. This concept works really well for Bo Burnham. Bo Burnham can work for a year on songs and uh, a special and then out of the blue drop it on Netflix and it's an event and everybody watches it and talks about it and, like it comes it comes out of nowhere that works for Bo Burnham most people are not Bo Burnham most people like he is in a special category of creator who could get away with dropping something out of the blue uh, this works for Michael from Vsauce 1 he spends a really long time on his videos, doesn't say anything about them ahead of time for a variety of reasons. And then all of a sudden a new one is uploaded and he'll just tweet it out. And it's like, holy crap, there's a new Vsauce. Mm -hmm. Well, Bo Burnham is one of the most successful creators of the last decade. Uh, Michael is one of the most successful educational YouTubers of all time. Most people are not those things. I think that <laughs> that's the king effect, isn't it? It is exactly uh, what it is. The king effect. Yeah. Yeah. So Google the king effect. Look it up. There's a good Wikipedia, short Wikipedia entry on it too. And you'll look at that and just be like, oh, okay. You know, and people do this all the time with sports. I remember, I'm going to, I'm going to make this one a, a Kevin themed San Francisco 49ers reference. There was this thing, uh, Jerry Rice was talking about, uh, helping his father lay bricks as a kid and they would throw the bricks to him and he'd catch the bricks and he needed to catch those bricks with what you'd say, I suppose, is soft hands, you know, letting it, 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 uh, kind of slowly, gently come back into your hand as you catch it. So it doesn't break. You don't drop it, whatever. So I read the thing where it's like, I, I'm going to 
like throw bricks in a pile and throw them up in the air and catch them and do this so that I develop good hands. Well, look, <laughs> that I, I'm sure that did help Jerry Rice catch passes much, much better. Um, but but that that's an exception. Like there's a reason why you don't go into training facilities and see a giant pile of bricks for the, the wide receivers. <laughs> uh, it, it's just it's, it's the king effect. This one thing worked for the the one guy, and he happens to be in a class that is way, way above anybody else. Even even in his league, he's you know at the top. But yeah, it, oh. yeah, <laughs> it's frustrating to think about all of that that I see on Twitter, where it's like, here are the twelve things that you know geniuses do to do whatever. I'm like, no, they are specific to that person most of the time. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the Bo Burnhams and the Vsauces of the world got to that after a long time of doing a ton of content all the time. And it ends up being kind of like an end goal thing. You have to get to a point. You have to ascend <laughs> the mountain. Once you're at the top of the mountain, then you can kind of call the shots. Until then, I think yeah. the best idea is to you know, be as in people's faces as possible, build up an audience. And I don't see how you build up an audience by, you know, sticking with being in the attic, and then releasing something once a year and like hoping people notice. How are they going to notice? How are they going to find you? I, I don't see it. Well, the, the second one that I uh, wanted to make sure we would hit is from Dan the Latch. He's got a he's got a really good question that's been nagging me for like. 15 years. Why is it called a grind when good work that you're passionate about adds to your life more than it subtracts and it, it doesn't wear you down as much as it builds you up? Is there a better word than the grind? And I, boy, I wish I, I wish I could think of one because that point is absolutely right. Charles says the hustle and that has its own connotations that are a little like less serious and I don't, I don't know. Uh, but, but you know, the grindstone most people don't think of grinding anything as being terribly positive. And it sounds like work. Uh, Kevin, do you have any suggestions on what we could call this? I, I like that comment. That's such a good comment because you're right. The, it's really the grind. The branding is off on this. It, yeah, <laughs> it's not It's not appealing. It's not an appealing uh, euphemism. Oh. Uh, I don't know. I was really trying to think of like bodybuilding terms because that's kind of the best analogy the pump. yeah the pump the build <laughs> the the shred build, yeah i don't shred. know shit yeah it's very aggressive i know yeah and it reminds me of you know like 80s hair metal guitar playing shredding a guitar i don't know yeah the build I, isn't very exciting uh, but it there has I does have to be something like that gains gains i think yeah i think i know something. I don't know the word, but I, I do think I know where it's going to come from. I think that whatever term fits the best here is going to come out of a Schwarzenegger or a Stallone movie. <laughs> There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that a phrase that one of their characters uses in a movie is the best possible fit for this question. I don't, mm. I don't know what it is. I would have to go back and hit both catalogs pretty hard, which is probably a good idea anyway. It's been a while. But that attitude is of, of like positivity plus sacrifice is built in to those types of movies. And that's really the combination that's happening with the grind is uh, a, a positive attitude to build towards something, to get the gains, all the things that people are throwing out in chat, and you're making smart sacrifices to do it. And you're sometimes dealing with very difficult stuff. The last thing you want to do is grind, but but you 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 do it anyway. You don't take the easy way. Um, you choose the hard one because you think it's going to pay off. So it's that combination of positivity and sacrifice. Uh, yeah, now it's it's killing me that that I don't have a specific quote from either of them, but now I'm going to go back. Like this is, what is it? The end of September. We have Q4. We have three months to solve this solve this problem. And I think that we we should set that goal. That by the end of the year, we need to come up with something better than the grind. Or we admit that the grind is the best possible way. Mm, okay. Well, I have an image, at least, to share with everyone that you are already familiar with, I Matt. I know what it is. I know, I know what it's going to be. <laughs> I used to represent. 
and Charles kind of could pull this up in three seconds in the episode chat. It is, I call it Arnold logging. So you're right. I mean, we do default to Schwarzenegger on this, but there's a scene in the yep. very beginning of Commando, which is a completely ridiculous movie. If no one has ever seen Com- it's not great. Commando, <laughs> it is great. Uh, yeah, but it is ridiculous. <laughs> there's a scene in which he's basically carrying a tree. Um, there it is. So it's in the chat. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger carrying basically an entire tree. I mean, it is a gigantic log. Beyond the size, though, it looks like ash. And ash is heavy as hell. Ash is what baseball bats are made out of. It's not a light, soft wood. If he were carrying a, a pine, it would still be impressive. But it wouldn't be as impressive. The fact that he's got like a 10 foot, 12 inch <laughs> diameter log of something like ash is insane. <laughs> so, you know, at least we can leave our listeners with something. If you want some, if you want to know what I use as a physical representation, a little piece of imagery that helps define this grind, whatever we want to end up calling it, whatever word we use. I like to call it Arnold logging, and it's this image of Arnold Schwarzenegger from Commando holding a tree. That, to me, is emblematic of the grind. So uh, Arnold is quiet grinding. He is never quiet quitting. Neither should you. It's garbage. And if you if you disagree, <laughs> then let us know. Let's hear it. Let Give us your yeah. justification because we are very open-minded. I'm open to that. We're open-minded. Yeah, I am it. open to exceptions to this. To I, I would love to understand it better because it's, it's really interesting to me in terms of being a phenomenon that this is a topic that many, many people are talking about. This is not some obscure uh, opinion piece in a shitty business magazine that I used to subscribe to. It's not one of those. No, a lot of people are thinking about this. Now we've come off a period where tons of people are changing jobs and it does appear like a lot of people want to quit quietly. Um, And so I find that significant and interesting. And if there's more to it, things we didn't talk about, things we're wrong about, uh, I I absolutely want to know. Yeah, we welcome it Uh, until then. Please Google image search commando tree or Arnold Schwarzenegger tree, uh, print that out, frame it and hang it above your computer or in your cubicle at work. I don't know, uh, in the break room at work, let's spread the Arnold logging ethos around the world. I think that's important. All right. Pick up a log of your own. Yes, (laughs) that's right. That's right. Carry just walk log. around with it. I don't know what you do with it. Just, just, just carry it. Yeah, there is a biblical reference here. If uh, anyone, anyone has two brain cells to put that together. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, we will be back next week with the wonderful and pleasant and very smart Jabril. So I hope that you will join us yep. for that. Until then, we are out of here and we will see you, Space Cowboys. Thanks for listening to The Create Unknown. We make this show with the support of our patrons. 100% of that goes directly to keeping episodes going every week. And the recent support has been amazing. Sidpoke, NRM, Venture Addicts, Weezer Good, you all really do make this show happen. Thank you to the Tots and Dumpster crew, old and new, who save tiny little lives every month. Thank you to our grizzled, battle-hardened child infantry. Clemente De Los Santos, Dan the Latch, Demetrius Andrews, Erica, Farrakhan, Jen Mefasanti, Kevin Menard, Mikhail Steinke, Monahim, Natsu, Penny Peddler, Rise Bread, Ryan Kinder, Samuel Manser, Sean S., Sean Malone, and Tom Videoger. And a tremendous shout out to our elite baby gang commanders. Atrocious Guff, Cat, Dojangles, Graham Robertson, James Gallagher, Jeff Davis, Orange Vanilla Coke, Patrick Pister, TCU's personal pilot, Andy, Ryan Carroll, Baseweight, Vinthos, Yetis Deletus, Jonas Walter, Nathan Robinson, Jelksies, and of course, Trevstead. You are the elite. Thank you as well to our indentured servants, producer editor Ben Webster, Minecraft mogul Laterman, Discord kitten wrangler Conrad, and producer emeritus Dan Yoshua. Thanks to Baseweight for use of Created in the Unknown for the opening theme. Thanks to Electro Voice for giving us mics to sound good on top of it. And a special thanks to Main Gear for powering all of our PC endeavors. The Create Unknown is an unknown media production in partnership with Studio 71.